Jesus warns us to adjust our expectations as well as our preparations. Listen closely for the word of God to us all. But nobody knows when the day or hour will come, at the heavenly angels and not the Son. Only the Father knows. As it was in the time of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the human one. In those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And so the day Noah entered the ark, they didn't know what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. The coming of the human one will be like that. At that time, there will be no men in the field. Only one. There will be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, say the Lord, you don't know what day the Lord is coming. But you understand that if the head of the house knew at what time a thief would come, he would keep aware he wouldn't, fall, wouldn't allow the thief to break into his house. Therefore, you also should be prepared, because a human one will come at a time you don't know. The word of the Lord. Thanks Because all you beautiful people would make time for me. But then, 
after I, after I began work at the conference center and I started to have a little bit more confidence and realized that I needed to be good with who I am. And I mean Annie. And I can guarantee you she was worth waiting for. So sometimes waiting. <laughs> so, sometimes, sometimes waiting. Um, is a good thing, but then sometimes it's just not, right? I mean, we we sit and we watch the clock go around, we watch the pot boil, or we wait for the cookies to come out, and then we kind of forget about them, and then maybe we get burned, and then we think, oh my gosh, they're all messed up. I mean, sometimes our waiting gets messed up. I mean, think about it. When the astronomical clock was going, there were a lot of people waiting for the big new moon that happened in November. Did everybody see that? Anybody take pictures of it? No? Did you have a friend that had a telescope? Did you look at it that way? Okay. Don't miss the next opportunity. But they wait for things like that. They wait for planets to align. They wait for really good things to happen in the sky. I wonder if we take time to really think about how we wait. I mean, I wonder if we look at waiting much like we do going to the doctor's office. Anybody like waiting in there? Why not? It's nerve wracking. What? You make an appointment and they keep it. Yeah, you go there and you're still waiting 30 minutes. We have, we have an, opt um, an optometrist um, that we see that we might not be seeing for too much longer. But um, he likes to make us wait a long time before we see him. He likes to talk too much. Um, I mean, waiting for God really isn't like this. It isn't. Waiting for God um, isn't so much, or shouldn't be so much, about what we're afraid is going to happen or, or what we hope doesn't happen. Waiting for God should be about what God has already done. Waiting for God should be rooted in who God is. The God we serve, y'all, is the God of creation. The God we serve is the one who was able to get the Israelites out of slavery in such spectacular fashion and then bring them to the promised land and even give them their own name and make them into a nation. The God we serve is the same God who is able to take our community and make it all that it is for more than 260 years. The God we serve was able to take folks dealing with cultural forces that we can't even imagine and to build a slave gallery because the conviction was we should all worship in the same place. The God we serve was able to draw us together and make us a nation even when we are at odds with each other. The God we serve is able to take our children. He will take us and teach us a thing or two. And thus, waiting on God becomes a function of anticipation. Not sitting around in a waiting room, waiting for everything to happen, but actually looking forward, wanting it to happen. I mean, imagine. Imagine. Here you have all these people that were waiting and looking around for a coming Messiah, and they missed the Messiah because they weren't anticipating. They were waiting. They were looking for things to be on their terms instead of remembering the God whom they serve and remembering that God always does it a little differently than we do. God always wants to turn things around. And so the only thing that we really can do in terms of really anticipating God, really hoping, is to prepare. So how many of you feel ready for Christmas? <laughs> so, okay, why are you ready for Christmas? 
Because it's Jesus' birthday. That's good. What else? Because, um... Wait, hang on. What did you get a hand Because you get a lot of presents? Okay, what were you going to say, Hope? Um, I was going to say because, um, it's the night Jesus was born and all the angels came. And the angels came? Sure. And told the shepherds to, uh, come and see Jesus. Told the shepherds. You, you got all blue chapter 2 down, but you know what? <laughs> Why, why are you ready for Christmas? Um, you don't know? Why are you ready for Christmas? You get to spend time with your family? Okay, now, come on, you've got to be impressed. Right? They can say one thing about, because all the food I get to eat and all the stuff and everything, well, they didn't see Christmas. Right? But come on. If they can get it, why can't we? I mean, really, anticipation, preparing for Jesus' coming, isn't about what we get. It's about what we've been given already. Think about the most spectacular gift you've ever been given. And what is it? Your dog. To be here right now, thank you. <laughs> You're doing it. But, I mean, how many of you, would, would that be a car? Yeah?
What is the symbol? Can any of these ornaments actually be Jesus Christ? Should we pray to these decorations or to the tree? Can any of these be equal to the actual wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Word of God, Son of God, friend, brother, savior, sacrifice, king, a man from Nazareth, the way. But even in these words, their power comes from our actual experience of Christ. As you meditate on this, don't forget to pay attention to the most important chrismon, the most important symbol of Christ, you. it can seem a pretty fleeting thing, right? Like the people who were hoping that the Cubs would win, of course they did get that this year. <laughs> what kinds of things do you hope for? Like on a daily basis. Y'all have any hope? A good day at work. A good day at work. <laughs> Sure. Good health. Good health? Absolutely. What kinds of things do you hope for? Love of family. Love of family? Find joy. To what? To find joy. To find joy? Yeah. It's kind of rough this election season, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, you, you get this sense that we, um, we hope for things that are in front of us, right? I mean, isn't that what hope is? You're looking toward the future because you're kind of hoping the future turns out some particular way or that something happens the way that you need it to, right? Isn't that what hope is? But that's not biblical hope. To, to explain what I mean, we've got, we got to get to the nitty-gritty about what... The, the nature of hope. First of all, hope, right, is waiting. How many of you like to wait? <laughs> Nobody, really? Because <laughs> I look at the early service, we had a whole row of little kids who all raised their hands and said, yes, we like to wait. <laughs> <laughs> they like to wait on Christmas. They like to wait on presents. They like to wait on food. And, and the thing is, the truth is, we... We kind of like to wait sometimes, don't we? Because some things are worth waiting for. I get to... Huh? Well, that might be. That might be. But, but think about it. You know, when I, when I sailed through high school and, and didn't date anybody, and then sailed through college and didn't date anybody because I was always someone's buddy, or friend, because all you beautiful people wouldn't make time for me. And um, as it turned out, the real issue was that I wasn't comfortable with myself. And the moment that I decided to accept myself for who I am, all of a sudden, I find me. And this is going to lose its effect, because I said this earlier, but she was definitely worth waiting for. And so, you, and so yes, yeah, sometimes we do. Wait. We love to wait. Because it kind of creates that tension that, well, maybe I can savor what's coming. But, but waiting in the Bible isn't really like that. Um, I'll tell you this. It's not, it's not really like um, 
like those who are in astronomy who are waiting for the big supermoon. Did everybody see that? Yes? yes. No? Did, you, did anybody take pictures? Really? You're not gonna <laughs> pull over. I got the wind, girl. It's not gonna happen again. This is for what? 50 years, 60 years? What? 20, 30 more. But um, but they wait on all kinds of things. They wait on um, nebulas, and they wait on um, stars and planets to align. They wait on black holes to do their thing. They wait on comets. And, and as they look at all of these heavenly bodies, they're waiting for a fleeting moment, just a moment, to be able to get that image, and then it's gone. But for them, it was worth it. But we're not waiting for something that's fleeting, either. That's not what biblical waiting is about. Now, I will say this, it's certainly not like waiting in a waiting room, right? Because how many people like doing that? And why don't you like waiting in a waiting room? There's sick people there. <laughs> There's sick people there, but what else? Boring. Boring. <coughs> you might get bad news. I don't have the remote control. You don't have? <laughs> you don't have the remote control? <coughs> it's funny. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the things that we're waiting for. But have you ever wondered what God is waiting on with us? Have you ever wondered what hopes that God has in us? What kind of hope did God have to have in order to do something like the cross? We're about to celebrate the sending of Jesus Christ and the incarnation and Jesus coming into the world and being in that manger, and we should celebrate that. But we celebrate it because of what Jesus came to do. What kind of hope must God have in us to do something like that? That's more than just waiting. <coughs> it's more than just waiting for bad news or, 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 or any of that. What God is doing is anticipating what we might be. God is anticipating who we can be. It's not waiting because we want the clock to wind out. It's anticipating, not just because of what we think might happen, but because of what has already happened. We place our hopes in God, not because... We just, out of the blue, believe God will do good things for us. We place our hopes in God because God has done wonderful things for us. Okay, well let's say that that's true. How do we have hope? How do we wait on God in the right way? Well, Jesus gives it to us, and you might have heard it a little bit, in the, in the Romans passage that was done around the Advent reading. Um, but it's preparation. It's preparation. Think of all the mountains that you have in your life. Think of them. What are they? Money? Work? School? Although that's not really a mountain for you. <coughs> what are your mountains? Is it grief? Is it inappropriate self-regard? What are the many mountains that you can think of, and what mountains can you name or conjure up that God hasn't already come to the zenith of? How many of you can think of a mountain that God can't climb and can't help you climb? You see, that kind of hope doesn't have anything to do with waiting for bad news or with, with hoping things turn out okay. That kind of hope isn't just a future thing. It's a here and now thing. 
That, that's why the Romans passage talks about getting our heads around our behavior now, not just for then. This is how we prepare. This is how we show God that our hopes in God are real and that God's hopes in us are justified. So let us live.